Good afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting of the Board of Public Utilities for the City of Santa Rosa to order. May we have a roll call, please? Please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Board Member Wright? Here. Board Member Watts? Board Member Walsh? Here. Board Member Grable? Here. Board Member Badenfort? Vice Chair Arnone? Here. Chair Galvin? Here. Let the record show that all board members are present with the exception of board members Watts and Badenfort. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a reminder to please mute your phones and microphones when you're not speaking, and please put away your cell phones and personal computers. At this point, we will uh, move to item number two. Any statements of abstention by board members? Okay, we'll move to, we have no study session. Uh, next item is item 4.1, the minutes for the July 21st, 2022 meeting. We'll now take uh, public comment on the minutes approval. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine for raising your hand. Secretary Manis. Chair, there are no hands being raised in Zoom and no members of the public <clears throat> wishing to make a public comment in person. Thank you, the minutes will be approved and entered. We'll now move to item 5.1, which is our staff briefing on water and recycled water. Director Burke. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Um, our staff briefing, as mentioned, is our water and recycled water supply update. Making the presentation will be Peter Martin, Deputy Director Water Resources, and Mike Prinz, Deputy Director Regional Operations. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Uh, happy to, pleasure, my pleasure to be here with, with the water supply update for you today. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, we'll start with uh, providing some storage statistics uh, in Lake Pillsbury. Um, as of today, uh, the storage in Lake Pillsbury is about 41,500 acre feet. Um, you know, and just in general, uh, you're starting to see that black curve starting to flatten off. You'll recall uh, with the last update, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission did allow PG&E to reduce their minimum flows into the Upper Russian River uh, effective July 27th. Um, this allowed them to reduce releases to an absolute minimum of five cubic feet per second. And uh, my understanding is they follow that minimum pretty closely. So uh, you're starting to see storage level off in that reservoir um, compared to where they were last year. Um, and so, um, you know, the order is expected at this point to last at least through mid-October. Um, obviously, pg is doing their best to manage their supplies like Pillsbury, uh, but obviously that comes at a cost uh, to the Upper Russian River uh, in the meantime. Uh, next slide. So uh, in terms of storage in Lake Mendocino, uh, current storage is at about 47,300 acre feet. Uh, in terms of storage comparison to last year, that's about 25,000 acre feet higher uh, than it was this time last year. Um, so that, that storage is about 63% of their target water supply storage. Um, and releases are at about 92 cubic feet per second. Um, I think uh, Sonoma is seeing about a thousand acre foot uh, loss per week right now. So, um, you know, the supplies are going down, but in terms of comparison to last year, they're in much better shape in the upper watershed than they were last year. Um, I did reference PG&E's, um, the order issued to PG&E by FERC uh, for their minimum releases. Um, you know, after that occurred on the 27th, there were curtailments for a lot of the junior water right holders in the upper watershed um, that were a result of those reduced releases by PG&E. Um, obviously, without that additional contribution to the flows in the Upper Russian River, uh, those junior water right holders uh, don't have water supply available anymore. Um, so, uh, you know, some water did tell us recently that they will be monitoring uh, those curtailments um, in addition to obviously monitoring channel losses uh, to make sure that they're meeting their minimum and stream flows under their existing order from the State Water Resource Control Board. Um, just uh, remember, the state board does have enforcement authority 
over those upper uh, Russian River water right holders. So, um, you know, continuing to see uh, how that plays out over the next few months. So, but uh, definitely uh, a different story uh, this year than last year, but it's still very critical in terms of water supply throughout the watershed. Next slide. Uh, Lake Sonoma, uh, again, just um, continues to track very closely with where we were last year. Um, current storage is at about 120,400 acre feet as of today. Um, this uh, represents a little less than 49% of the water supply pool in Lake Sonoma. Um, in general, week to week, uh, it's about 1,500 acre feet in terms of losses uh, per week. So. Uh, seeing that trend uh, very much closely aligned with the trends over the last few years. Um, and it's been looking very much like uh, the projection by uh, Sonoma Water that they will have uh, more than 100,000 acre feet uh, in the reservoir by the end of the water year uh, remains, uh, uh, you know, the expectation today. So um, the outflow from that reservoir is at about 100 cubic feet uh, per second. Uh, as of today. If we go to the next slide. So um, in terms of continuing to monitor compliance with the State Water Resource Control Board's temporary change order, um, since July, uh, some water has been tracking um, the differences in the diversions compared to 2020. Uh, as you know, the change order does have a requirement of a 20% reduction in diversions by Sonoma Water compared to 2020. Um, and as of today, or actually yesterday, excuse me, um, it is about 31.4% um, compared to 2020. So very much uh, meeting that target. And obviously that is a direct result of um, all the contractors um, doing their best to conserve water supplies and also utilize local supplies uh, in addition to maximizing groundwater use and other uh, uses as well. Next slide. Uh, in terms of tracking our own metrics here at the city of Santa Rosa, um, good news. Last month, uh, Santa Rosa residents did reduce their water use by 25% compared to 2020. Um, that, uh, you know, obviously tracks uh, better than our um, mandatory 20% uh, compliance measure that we have in stage three. So um, we're definitely meeting our targets at this point. Uh, overall water use has been reduced uh, by 18% since those uh, stage three went into effect last year. Um, and we're continuing to see uh, very much the community is responding uh, the way that they should. So next slide. So, uh, you know, it's halfway through the year. Um, just thought it'd be a good time to check in on some of the metrics related to, uh, you know, the community response and our water use efficiency team. You know, as I mentioned before, last month we had 25% target, uh, continuing to see a uh, long-term trend uh, close to the 20% target that we have uh, for the city. Um, but uh, what we're seeing is uh, remaining uh, interest uh, by the public in a lot of the uh, drought response measures and also um, the rebates and other programs we have available. Um, we're seeing pretty much the same level of interest that we saw the entirety of last year. So I can you know, adequately say that interest has not waned uh, since we began that drought declaration. Um, as of uh, today, so far this calendar year being in January, uh, our staff have responded to over 220 uh, water waste reports, uh, distributed uh, 4,300 uh, devices, and we're seeing a renewed interest in cash for grass rebates, actually um, quite a few pre-inspections. And uh, to date, over 100,000 square feet of turf has been removed under our uh, cash for grass rebate program. Uh, staff are out uh, doing quite a bit of individual water smart checkups and audits of homes and businesses. Uh, we have three new student interns within the last month uh, that are out there um, helping out in the public with that too as well and uh, teaming up with our team members and um, getting out and uh, talking to the public as well. And then gray water rebates, uh, you know, we've been hosting workshops in hopes that we'll get more interest, but um, you know, that is a bit of an investment and um, 
you know, I think though that, that as time goes on, we have seen folks that are more curious about how to implement gray water uh, systems. And then um, rainwater harvesting too remains um, of interest to folks. So again, um, starting to see an uptick um, in uh, people implementing water use efficiency measures in their homes. So uh, some good news there. Next slide. Just wanna remind everyone that uh, this weekend, there will be a region-wide um, summer pop-up uh, event. We'll have um, be handing out devices and buckets at uh, six different locations throughout Sonoma and Marin counties. Um, Santa Rosa Water will be at Friedman's Home Improvement uh, from 10 to two. It's been quite a bit of advertising and uh, media about this. I think a press release went out yesterday. Um, so we're hopeful uh, that the community will come out and participate and we're very grateful uh, to be able to team up with Friedman's uh, again um, on, a, on a drought event. So uh, next slide. Um, I think I think I've mentioned to this board in the past that uh, we've had a really good uh, opportunity to partner up with Daily Axe. Um, a very, very small contract, but uh, the city and other partnership uh, entities have been utilizing Daily Axe to host workshops and community engagement. Um, there will be a gray water tour um, in person at the city of Petaluma um, next weekend. I did check today. It is limited in terms of space. There are two spots left uh, as of today. So uh, if you want to sign up, um, should do so soon. But, uh, you know, again, uh, they'll be out uh, touring some homes that have gray water systems installed and uh, directing folks to how they can implement those and rebates that are available. Um, and then uh, in the beginning of September, uh, we'll be hosting a webinar, um, again, with the lawn gone and sheet mulching a webinar, really just focusing on how folks can uh, swap out turf and institute low water use uh, gardens as well. So, um, you know, definitely um, when we have these workshops, it's a great opportunity to start these conversations about resources that are available, um, some of the design elements uh, to become uh, very efficient outdoors. So uh, next slide. Uh, that concludes my portion of this presentation. I'll have to hand it over to uh, Deputy Director Prince. Good afternoon, Chair Galvin, members of the board. Uh, Mike Prince, Deputy Director of Regional Operations, just giving you a quick sort of mid-summer update on uh, recycled water supply status. Next slide. Um, this is a curve. You've seen different versions of this in the past. It's a smoothed curve showing our recycled water production. Uh, shows our average in gray and current production in black and last year's production in blue. Slightly higher production at this point in time relative to last year. And you can see on the left-hand side a pretty high spike uh, at the end of last calendar year. A lot of that is associated with uh, the big storm in October and some subsequent rain, but things have dropped off considerably slight rebound and now are slightly above last year in terms of daily production. Next slide. Uh, this is a chart that I, I don't know if it's ever been shown to the board before, but I, I stumbled upon it recently and I thought it would be interesting to show the board going back really uh, 20 years to show the general relationship between rainfall and recycled water production or influent flow, effluent flow is essentially the same. Um, from the plant and show, generally speaking, there's a pretty good correlation between rainfall and recycled water production. Um, this hasn't been updated yet for this year. It will be updated at the end of the water year, um, but I suspect it's gonna show a, a relatively low production because of the low rainfall. Um, I think it's just an interesting chart to, to show. We do track this and there is a pretty direct correlation between rainfall and uh, recycled water production. Um, next slide. This is our current uh, water supply storage curve. It's kind of a busy chart. I want to steer your attention to the red line. Um, that's the storage trend for this current water year. Um, there are a number of other lines on this chart. The horizontal line at the top, the red horizontal line is our maximum storage. Um, we actually would never want to get there and we would be discharging prior to getting to that point at any point in time. Um, there is a gray line sort of central in the chart area. That's our average. 
And then there are um, light blue lines that show our historical maximums and historical minimums. And then the black line is last year. So you can kind of see two years current storage um, at a time here. Um, right now, we're a little bit higher than the average. Um, we are, uh, as of the writing of this presentation, we weren't considering really any adjustments. However, we are getting to the time of year where we want to start targeting uh, where we want to wind up at the end of the year. And we really want to wind up somewhere in the 250 to 300 million gallon range. So uh, as of the preparation of this presentation, we weren't anticipating operational adjustments, but we are starting to consider whether or not we want to make any uh, for the balance of the year to get our storage levels really where we want them to be to get ready for wet weather. Um, but anyway, uh, this is a pretty standard chart. I'll also mention that there are two other lines, kind of uh, straight uh, and angular lines. The orange line shows sort of the upper limit of our operating envelope. And then the yellow line shows the, the lower limit of our normal operating envelope. Um, those are just target zones. Um, ultimately, we're looking at the historical maximums and minimums as, as good guides to measure where we are in general. Um, next slide. Um, this is a chart that uh, shows the distribution of storage between our ponds. In my last recycled water storage update, I showed you the chart on the left and the, the large gray portion of the pie chart is essentially empty volume. And you can see how when you look at the current state on the right, the um, light gray portion has decreased substantially. That's because water has been delivered um, to agricultural customers, our urban customers, and Calpine. And then you'll also notice a big change in the orange portion of the pie chart. And that's because we are emptying Delta Pond. It's essentially empty right now. Um, the majority of that emptying or redistribution of volume is to get ready for the start of the Geysers Delta Connection Project and just general consumption throughout the summer. Um, but I thought there would be some value in showing you um, sort of a snapshot of today's storage distribution versus um, my last recycled water storage update. So next slide. Um, here are a couple of statistics related to our agricultural allotments. Um, we started out with a 900 million gallon allotment in January, uh, which is about 53% of normal. Uh, we increased an additional 50 million gallons in April and then a whole 200 million gallons in July. So the total allotment for 2023 is looking to be 1.15 billion gallons. Um, we're not anticipating any increases at this late stage. Um, increases at this late stage in the summer um, or the season, I should say, um, doesn't necessarily help a lot if people have been as conservative with their allotments as has been the case so far. Um, but as I mentioned, as of the writing of this PowerPoint, we weren't anticipating changes in operational um, flow rates, essentially, but we are starting a conversation about that. So I suspect my next recycled water update will reflect um, any changes that we may uh, decide to make uh, over the next month or so. Next slide. That's really it. Happy to entertain any questions if you have any about uh, recycled water storage, and I'm sure Deputy Director Martin will be happy to entertain questions about water supply. Thank you to both the deputy directors for your reports. I'll open it up now for any board member questions or comments. Vice Chair Arnone. Uh, I, I just wanted to say concerning the uh, chart showing the correlation between rainfall and recycled water availability, I think that's a very helpful chart in explaining why sometimes we don't have as much recycled water as people might wish. Seeing that direct correlation shows how little is actually under our control in terms of how much recycled water we can produce. So I, I'm glad to see that chart in the deck and I think it's helpful as we go forward. Thank you and I wanna highlight that that really underscores the weather dependency of this operation uh, in general. Right. Other board member questions or comments? I just had one question for uh, Deputy Director uh, Martin. The 109 square feet of, of turf, is that just this year that's been removed? Yeah, that, that's, that's accurate. That's just this year. Um, we saw, I believe, somewhere around 150,000 square feet last year too. So um, definitely uh, 
substantially higher um, than we've seen in the past few years. So, uh, you know, obviously we increased the rebate amount, so that that drove some traffic there. But uh, we've been really pushing hard. Um, and furthermore, um, if you'll recall, uh, there was the uh, state requirement um, for the non-functional turf irrigation bin. Um, when we did do outreach to those irrigation customers, we reminded them that we had programs available and we've seen uh, some commercial and um, landscapes uh, contact us recently about some large landscape conversions. Great, thank you. Uh, any other board member questions or comments? Just board member Badenfort. Uh, thank you both. A quick question for uh, Deputy Director Martin. Um, one, thank you for the um, the outlay of the drought response metrics. It's really helpful. Um, generally, of course, not asking for um, exact comparisons. Um, does it represent a, a, a noticeable increase in the grass turf, the checkups and rebates noticeably higher this year um, than in previous years? And if so, is anything needed to ensure that that's available for the remainder of the year? Yeah, um, gosh, I wish I had I presented a pretty in-depth evaluation of the past few years to the Climate Action Subcommittee. Um, recently uh just more on metrics related to the climate action plans but it included a lot of these kind of year-to-year -year graphics i could come back with that same graphics if it's helpful so that this board could really see uh that increase over the past few years um i don't know that i have those numbers uh readily available to compare um gosh i wish i'd printed it out ahead of time so um if, if director burke uh could um, you know? I could bring it back uh, if uh, if that would be helpful too. I'm certainly yes. not not asking for a whole analysis. I was just asking generally, and that um, and that if so, is there anything that's needed from this board to consider um, stabilizing and fortifying that um, throughout the rest of the year? Thank oh, you. I, I get the question. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, um, obviously we do have a uh, capital outlay that kind of, you know, um, obviously is dedicated to making sure that there is funding for these rebates. Um, we're always, obviously, of course, looking for grants too as well. Um, there's a lot out there right now, and we're hoping to secure some of those. But uh, right now, um, there is plenty of funding to continue to support those programs. Um, in, in the meantime, uh, you know, of course, we'll look and forecast ahead um, for the next fiscal year, um, which I understand will be starting to look at budgets very early this year. So uh, we're definitely tracking that, so. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, any other board member questions or comments? If not, we will open it up for public comment on item 5.1. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. Chair Galvin, there are no hands being raised in Zoom and no public comments being provided from council chamber. Very good, thank you. Thanks for the, again for the presentation. We'll now move to uh, the consent calendar. We have two matters on the consent calendar, item 6.1 and item 6.2. I'll move adoption of the consent calendar. A second. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Chair Arnone and a second by Board Member Badenfort to approve the consent calendar. Are there any board member questions or comments at this point? Very well, we'll now take public comments on items 6.1 and 6.2. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. There are no hands being raised via Zoom and no one in council chamber wishing to make a in-person comment. Thank you, may we have a roll call vote please? Thank you. Board member Wright. Uh, yes, aye. Board member Walsh. Aye. Board member Grable. Aye. Board Member Badenfort? Aye. 
Vice Chair Arnone? Aye. And Chair Galvin? Aye. Let the record show that this consent calendar passed with six affirmative votes. Thank you, that'll take care of the consent calendar. We'll move to item 7.1. Director Burke. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Item 7.1 is a report item, authority to issue design build request for proposals for the Lano Trunk Rehabilitation Phase 1. And making the presentation will be uh, Rochella Maeda, who's our Associate Civil Engineer on the Capital Projects team. Thank you, Director Burt. Good afternoon, Chair Galvin and members of the board. As Director Burt mentioned, my name is Rochelle Maeda and I'm an engineer with the Public Works Department. Today, I am seeking authorization to issue a design build request for proposals for the Lano Trunk Rehabilitation Phase 1. I also want to note that in attendance today is Mark Kindhouse with Skanska, and Skanska has been the city's advisor as we navigate through several projects using design build. So if there are any questions after the project specific about design build that I cannot answer, he will be available to weigh in. Next slide, please. I'll start off with a little bit of project background. I'll give some background on how design build works, and then I'll discuss considerations for using design build procurement method for this project, and then I will end with the recommendation. Next slide, please. As part of the 2021 Sanitary Sewer Master Plan update, an engineering firm inspected and assessed approximately 13 miles of large diameter trunk sewers throughout the city's collection system. And the assessment provided the city with rehabilitation priorities for its trunk sewers, which are shown here. So all of those colorful segments indicate trunk sewers that were assessed as part of that effort. And so the, the red lines represent trunk sewers that are high priority for being rehabilitated. And then orange represent um, being slated for rehab in the near term, yellow in the midterm, green in the long term. And then those blue segments represent current lining or rehabilitation projects. If you look towards the bottom of your screen near that blue pentagon, that represents where the Laguna treatment plant is. And so Wano Road, just to the north of that, you can see a high density of red and orange segments, meaning that there's a high need for rehabilitation in that area. Next slide, please. Zooming into that area, um, this looking at the graphic on the right is the project extents for the Lano Trunk Rehabilitation Phase 1, shown in green. And again, towards the bottom of your screen, you can see the treatment plant, and towards the top, Todd Road runs east-west. The project will include trenchless technology for lining approximately 7,500 linear feet of 66-inch reinforced concrete pipe, and then also rehabilitate, rehabilitating 12 manhole structures. Options for lining or rehabbing this section of pipe include cured in place pipe lining and spiral wound lining. For the manholes, rehab will vary from hydrogen sulfide protection to structural trenchless lining. Plant staff estimate that the peak dry weather flow for this trunk line is approximately 16 million gallons a day. So this is a flow that would need to be bypassed while the line is being rehabilitated. I also want to point out that the Lano trunk line here conveys approximately two thirds of the city's wastewater flow. So while the bypass is in operation, it would need to be monitored 24 seven. We do anticipate needing county permits for the bypass, which will cross Todd and Lano roads. And since we are in California tiger salamander territory, we will, we do anticipate needing a permit through the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, we may need an additional permit through them and then also the water board, depending on how the bypass system passes and, or crosses Colgan Creek, which is located just to the north of the treatment plant. Next slide, please. Here you can see the team organization for the traditional design bid build on the left and then design build on the right. So under design bid build, the city has two separate contracts, one with the designer and one with the builder, and each of them has their own consultants and subcontractors. Under design build, the city would have a single contract with a design builder who then has their own team of consultants, subs, and designers. And then an important element that's not shown here is, is the element of time. 
And so with design bid build, the city first contracts with the designer who then develops the construction documents. And then after that, the city contracts with the builder and the project is constructed. With design build, on the other hand, from project initiation, the city would be under contract with the design builder. So we would have the designer and the builder under contract from the start of the project. Next slide, please. In 2014, City Council adopted Ordinance 4021, which outlined regulations for the award, use, and evaluation of design-build contracts. And per that ordinance, prior to issuing a design-build request for proposals for a major contract, a department must obtain approval from either City Council or the Board of Public Utilities to determine that the use of design-build procurement is in the best interest of the city. As part of the design build process, we would have a selection committee to evaluate the design builders who propose on the job. And this would be a two-step selection process. So first, the city would release a request for qualifications to pre-qualify design builders. And the, sele the selection committee would then use pre-qualification criteria that are outlined in that ordinance, and then also any other project-specific criteria to review and rank design builders. Next, only the top ranked design builders would receive a request for proposals. And again, the selection committee would review and rank those proposals based on predetermined performance criteria. Once the selection committee makes a, selects a design builder, we would then seek approval from the board to award the contract. As I mentioned before, the city would have a contract with the designer and the builder from the start of the project. And so this setup really allows for more upfront collaboration between all parties, which can help reduce project unknowns early on, and then also result in a more buildable project. So for example, for large lining projects like this one, the bypass system has been a challenging component of construction in the past, and it could be more than the actual cost of lining or rehabilitation itself. So by using design build for this contract, we can openly discuss with the builder how the bypass system will be configured in the early stages of design rather than figuring out those details during construction where we could run into large design changes. And then instead of a designer focusing on developing biddable documents, they can work with the builder to develop a more buildable and innovative project that meets the city's needs. Next slide, please. It is recommended by the Transportation and the Public Works Department and the Water Department that the board by motion authorize issuance of a request for proposals for the design build procurement method for the Lano Trunk Rehabilitation Phase 1. Thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Maeda. I'll open it now for any questions or comments by the uh, board, board member Wright. Uh, two questions. Uh, one question is, uh, do we have a schedule that, you know, an attentive schedule? Uh, and then the second question is, um, so you have this pre-qualifications period where you interview and do all this kind of stuff. At the end of the day, the award is based on a proposal or is it based on an actual bid of pre-qualified folks? That, those are my question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, we do have a tentative schedule, and if you'd like, I can get that email to you. As of now, I know that construction isn't slated until about summer of 2024. Um, and then as far as the proposals go, it'll be when we when we put out the request for qualifications, they will submit um, you know, the team that will be working on it and any prior experience with similar projects and then also with design build projects. And then their proposals will actually consist of almost um, preliminary design for the project and what they think will meet the city's needs as far as how the project needs to be constructed. And as part of that review process, um, with design builds, you can actually have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with the proposal, the design builders that are proposing and discuss with them um, what kind of design elements would help, you know, help meet the project's needs as far as, um, you know, bypassing and any environmental needs. Does that answer your questions? We can also ask Mark Kainhouse to weigh in a little bit more if you'd like. So when they do their proposal, obviously they have a cost in there. So it does, it is in the, uh, I mean, you know the cost, so you're not choosing it blindly. 
Yes, uh, sorry, I forgot to address the cost. That is correct. The cost is included in their proposal. It's just right. that with design build, the cost is not the only deciding factor. Right. Um, so we would establish performance criteria ahead of time and the cost would probably would be one of those things that we consider. Oops. Board member okay, Walsh. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that I really appreciate the collaboration up front and how that may reduce surprises for the builder and get the builder a chance to have communication with the designer and the uh, and, and staff, the project managers for this. Um, so thank you very much. Um, also, uh, this good presentation. I appreciate that. And the one question is, does the design build process, does it reduce the number of, uh, of uh, participants that are able to bid on designing it and then bid on building it? Um, and if so, how might that impact the project in this case? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, in the beginning phases, it does not limit how many people can bid on the project. When we release the request for qualifications, anybody that is a design builder can submit their qual statement of qualifications to us. And then where it would be limited potentially is after we receive those statements of qualification, then we shortlist a handful, maybe three to five of those design builders. And those are the, the teams then that receive um, a request for proposals. I see. Um, it, uh, I'll get a little more specific. So, are there are there potential builders that would not be able to participate in the project overall because they don't both design and build? E yes. Yeah. That that would be the case. So, if a builder a builder would need to team up with a designer to be able to to be on this project. Yeah. I say great. So, so as long as they're okay with the process and they've done this type of process before, they should be okay. Great, thank you very much, appreciate you. that. Any other board member questions or comments? Vice Chair Arnone? I just wanna say as, as um, uh, somebody who served on the Charter Review Committee in 2012, um, and leading to the adoption of the ordinance authorizing design build in 2014, I'm glad that in 2022, we're seeing a project come to uh, this board to, uh, to actually use the tool that was provided low those many years ago. So I'm just glad we've made this much progress. Thank you for your comment. Any other board member questions or comments? All right, I will entertain a motion. I will move that the board authorize the issuance of a request for proposals for the design build procurement method for the Yano trunk rehabilitation phase one. I will second that motion. Thank you. We have a motion by board member Wright, seconded by board member Walsh. We'll now open it up for public comments on item 7.1. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. Chair Galvin, I see no hands being raised in Zoom and no one in council chamber wishing to make a public comment in person. Thank you. May we have a roll call, please? Thank you. Board member Wright. Uh, aye. Board member Walsh. Walsh. Aye. Board member Grable. Aye. Board member Badenfort. Aye. Vice Chair Arnone. Aye. And Chair Galvin. Aye. Let the record show that this motion passes with six affirmative votes with board member Watts absent. Very good, thank you very much. That takes care of our uh, report item 7.1. We'll now move to item eight, which is public comments on, on non-agenda matters. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. There are no public comment hands via Zoom and no one in council chamber wishing to make a in-person public comment. Thank you. Uh, we have no referrals. We have no written communications. We have not had any subcommittee meetings, so I don't believe there's any subcommittee reports. We'll move to board member report. Vice Chair Arnone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say I was lucky enough to attend the celebration on Wednesday, July 27th, in which uh, all the 
many participants uh, celebrated the successful conclusion of the North Seward Trunk Relocation Project at the Deterk Round Barn. It was a lovely venue and um, a lot of congratulations were well deserved and a project that has now been completed in a very efficient manner with uh, really good communications that were uh, carried out between the cities and the neighbors and uh, so I, I think it went very smoothly for a project of that significance that could have had that much potential to, to disrupt neighborhoods. So it was just a, a nice conclusion to a big project and I was pleased to be able to attend on behalf of the BPU. I appreciate you being there since I was out of town, so thank you for making the effort. Any board member questions or comments regarding the report from Vice Chair Anoni? All right, we will open up for public comments on item number 12. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. There are no hands being raised via Zoom and no one in council chamber wishing to make a public comment. Thank you. We'll now move to the director's report. Director Burke. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. I have a couple items to report on to the board today. Um, first, um, as the board may recall, in addition to the funding we have uh, previously applied for and received from the state to assist our customers who were dealing with uh, arrearages in their water and sewer bill, we have uh, successfully enrolled in the Low Income Housing Assistance Program. So that's a new program that's being offered uh, by the state. And that program has opened and they are now accepting applications. And to date, we have received a little under $9,000 in funding that has been applied to seven accounts. Customers uh, must meet certain income requirements and then they need to submit their application to the North Coast Energy Services, Inc. Uh, that is the um, organization that has been hired by the state to run this program. Once processed, the funds are sent directly to the city to be applied to the customer account. Each qualifying customer uh, can receive a maximum of $2,000 towards overdue bills. And then uh, we will make sure that that money is applied to either their past due account, uh, as the board may recall, what we decided to do was basically give everyone a fresh start so we have these um, their past due amount in a separate account and we will apply that towards that past due amount first and if there's anything left over then we will apply that to their current bills. So I wanted to let the board know that that is now another opportunity available for our customers. Also wanted to give the board an update. Um, you may recall that a couple board meetings ago you approved an agreement with Verily uh, that is a um, company that is analyzing our sewage, looking for various um, uh, different strains of disease and, and they are actually paying us. Uh, they're compensating the city $200 per sample. Um, so we have uh, executed that agreement and we have submitted our first samples. And we did receive um, our initial first data. Uh, Verily is testing for uh, not only for COVID and various variants of COVID, but also for monkeypox. And um, uh, like I said, we're very new to the program, so we have one result so far. Uh, we did find that there is some uh, monkeypox in this region. Um, uh, but uh, too early to have any statistical data or more information because it's literally one data point at this point. If you're interested in seeing the information, um, our data is now up on their website and that's publichealth.verily and that's spelt V as in Victor, E-R-I-L-Y dot com. Again, that's publichealth.verily.com. And we continue to share this information with our local public health officer and office uh, so they can track the data as well. And then last, um, I have uh, some very sad news to share. Um, uh, it's with a very heavy heart that I let you know that one of our team members uh, passed away. Um, Tony Gonzalez was a utilities systems operator too. 
Um, he was a beloved 23 year employee with the water department. Um, a couple weeks ago, he went home and uh, passed away at his home over the weekend. Uh, Tony is a Pioneer High School alumnus. He was a huge Raider fan. Um, and he was just such an integral part of our local field operations. Tony was always quick with a smile. He was eager to help out, always willing to share his knowledge and experience with newer employees. And he really was one of our go-to experts of the crew. Um, there was a lovely celebration of life held for Tony on August 13th. A number of water department employees attended as well as our assistant city manager. Uh, it was very nice to meet his mom and his aunt and his daughter. And we are just uh, very saddened uh, by the loss of Tony and we send our best to his family. Um, gone too soon, but won't be forgotten. And um, thank you for letting me share that information with you. Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up for any board member questions or comments regarding the director's report. All right, seeing none. We will open it up for public comments on item number 13. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. There are no hands being raised in Zoom and no one in council chamber for public comment in person. Thank you. That concludes our agenda for today's meeting. So I'd like to adjourn the meeting in memory of Tony Gonzalez and send our prayers and condolences to his family. We are now adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs>